thoracoabdominal emergencies. I like to color code things by organ. You can see this is how we will break this down. The first group are thoracic emergencies, the next group intestinal emergencies, and lastly, viscous and vessel emergencies. I'm, if you've seen my presentations before, they're usually just straight case presentation, but I thought some additional information about the pathologies we'll be viewing would be helpful for people so you'll see I have the a typical age range and gender distribution, pink for female, blue for male, white for equal in both genders, right? We will do the annual incidence of each of these pathologies per 100,000, that's in green on the second line. I will present icons representing the risk factors in red, the percentage mortality, uh, for that entity. And then last, the CT sensitivity. All of these stats were taken from the uh, NCBI, the National Center for Biometric Information. All right, another aortic dissection, 50 to 65 males, three out of 100,000, hypertension and smoking, 75% in the wild, 48% if previously diagnosed, but high mortalities in either case. Again, about 98% sensitivity on the CT. All right, this is the other great complication of aortic dissections. You can see the linear filling defect here, but look at that left posterior aspect of the aortic root. That linear filling defect is passing right across the left coronary ostium. So you can see the left main and the LAD are showing no enhancement. And so that is the dread complication of this. And look at this. We've got normal enhancement of the myocardium here in the posterior basal and uh, uh, basal septum. But the rest of the left ventricle, as you can see, is quite hypodense and is underperfused. And that is, of course, the distribution of that left coronary. Here we see it. This is the linear filling defect. It's much too high, right? That is not aortic valve. It's it's significantly higher than the level of the valve, which is probably sitting around here, right? And again, note the perfusion of the normal septum and base, right? But the hypodense, underperfused myocardium. And there you can see the left coronary with no contrast within it. And again, the posterior basal and septal enhancement. All right, so on the movie, track that left aspect of the dissection flap there. It just crossed the coronary ostium, and there is that non-enhancing left coronary system. It's got a little retrograde fill, so you do see some later on. And there is the perfused myocardium, that posterior basal portion. Let's watch that again. Here comes that dissection flap right over the ostium. No enhancement in the proximal left coronary system. And then that underperfused left ventricle already starting to dilate up, in fact. Pretty impressive. You'd be drawn to this too by the stranding in the superior uh, mediastinum and the anterior that you can see right there. I uh, think even if the flap weren't so distinct, you'd still uh, know something was happening here. Here it is on the coronals, and you can watch that flap there on the patient's left. It just crossed the ostium, and there's that left coronary system and the normal enhancing basal myocardium. All right, so that was an aortic dissection with coronary occlusion. Well, this is an odd one that doesn't fit with all the books. Uh, so atrial tumor thrombus, I decided not to give an age and uh, to simply call this a one in a million kind of finding. Uh, cancer is the risk factor and the mortality is pretty much 100% and you'll see why. So the uh, CT I found, at least in this case, to be very sensitive. So 
Here is the atrial filling defect, which by itself uh, could just be clot, right? But uh, look at what it's doing. We've got widespread infarcts in the liver, in the kidneys, and in the spleen, but also low down enough, the aorta is occluded. So there's the liver infarct, the splenic infarct, renal infarcts, and the classic wedge-shaped cortical distribution. But look at that. That's where it all came from. A huge mass in the right upper lobe that is invading the pulmonary vein and gaining access that way to the right atrium. So let's look again. So here are all the infarcts, liver, spleen, kidneys, just classic appearance. And here is the right upper lobe mass. Now it's invading the pulmonary vein. There it is entering the atrium from where it causes all this trouble. And then lastly, you'll see that aorta wink out. So that is a primary lung cancer with pulmonary venous and atrial invasion and extensive arterial embolization. Another one I don't think AI is going to be figuring out anytime soon. All right, let's go on to some intestinal emergencies. Gastric volvulus. This is equal in genders and typically occurs in patients over 50. The incidence is unknown. I don't know uh, why that would be, but every source I sought uh, said the incidence is unknown. So I don't know. It could be all around us. Uh, prior hernias, hiatal hernias uh, particularly, and prior surgeries are the most important risk factors. The mortality is high at 40%. And again, if undiagnosed, similar to PE, it's 80%. Pretty striking. Uh, and that's, that's true uh, with a lot of G, uh, GI pathologies, you know, esophageal, uh, and gastric injuries as well, really, really are tied in a mortality stamp, from a mortality standpoint, really are tied to the uh, time until diagnosis. In fact, in traumas, most of them are given as diagnosed within eight hours, 16 hours, or 24 hours, because it significantly uh, degrades your chances. Lastly, the CT is only about 80% sensitive, so this is one to watch for. All right, the most important thing, I think, is identifying this particular thing, that the duodenum, the proximal duodenum, and pylorus sit above the GE junction, okay? And that's what we're looking at right here, okay? You've got antrum here, pylorus, and proximal duodenum right there, and we will see on the movie, right, that ultimately this is sitting above the GE junction. You can see the NG tube uh, right there. In fact, there is the NG tube. So a uh, favorite pimp question when I'm giving this live is uh, what is the triad? That's Borchardt's triad, which is epigastric pain, retching, meaning non-productive vomiting, and failure to pass an NG tube. Of course, uh, that's only present in, uh, of, I think it's 70% of people with gastric volvulus, you are unable to pass an NG tube. So this is one of those 30%, because as you can see, the NG tube not only goes through the GE junction, but you can see it there in the body of the stomach. All right, medial spleen displacement. Oh, sorry, the, ga the gastric distension, of course, that we've already probably noted. But also look at that dis medial displacement of the spleen. This was actually... Uh, dropped in our teaching file by one of our radiologists who said called it the wandering spleen. I thought that was so cool. It's just a poetic name. But in fact, the wandering spleen can be seen with a lot of things. So it's not actually specific for gastric volvulus. But you sure can see why it happens, right? There's a gastroleonogastric sorry, ligament, which is just a band of peritoneum, uh, that would drag the spleen along with the stomach wherever it went. All right, so let's watch that GE junction, and we're going to see that it is below the duodenum. There it is. That's the critical finding. So you can see that medial spleen displacement is certain to catch your eye, as is the uh, marked gastric distension.
But the thing that I really hang my hat on is that GE junction line beneath the duodenum or inferior to the duodenum. All right. That is the mesenteroaxial type of volvulus, the organoaxial being sort of a mid portion body twist rather than this whole uh, torquing of the stomach with the displacement of the duodenum. Right, let's watch that one more time. There's the duodenum above the GE junction and that medial displacement of the spleen. All right, an annular pancreas. This is one that you don't typically see become overtly symptomatic, as in this case. Typically, these present uh, in the first year or two of age, equal gender distribution. The incidence is about 10 per 100,000. Risk factors include uh, Down syndrome, TE fistulas, or other uh, tracheoesophageal developmental anomalies, uh, and lastly is in any kind of inflammation in the uh, uh, in the bowel. Mortality is about 35% when presenting acutely, but that again is only amongst those with symptoms. And a 92% sensitivity on CT scan. So this is a great one though. This patient made it into adulthood. There is a rim of pancreatic tissue surrounding the duodenum, which you will see on the movie, significantly narrows that lumen. There's a lot of peripancreatic and peri periduodenal fluid, and within the wall of the duodenum, there is a focal contrast collection, essentially a pseudoaneurysm. So this is an unusual case. Again, the patient has uh, reached a fairly ripe old age before presenting. There was significant obstruction that probably increased the exposure of this duodenal mucosa to acid, right, and ultimately eroded into it and created that pseudoaneurysm, which then, uh, by virtue of its presence, is causing that uh, periduodenal bleeding or stranding. So let's look at that again. You can track the slightly dilated duodenum, then it pinches down. Look at that pancreatic tissue forming a nice, perfect donut around it. And then there's that pseudoaneurysm within the duodenal wall. So pretty unusual to present that dramatically in an adult, but pretty neat case. Okay, let's look at a gallstone ileus. This is my favorite case of gallstone ileus. More common in women because, of course, gallstones are, and women over 60 for this particular entity. It is an incidence of around three or four per 100,000. The risk factor is gallstones. No shock there. I was surprised to see a relatively high mortality of 20%. Uh, that was pretty striking to me. Most of the patients I've seen with this clinically have done fairly well and a 93% sensitivity on CT scan. So this patient was a, a truly dramatic presentation. They came in with retching to the extent that there is pneumomediastinum and a pneumothorax on these lung windows. So there almost certainly is a lower esophageal perforation related to this retching and a pneumothorax. So pretty impressive the degree of retching uh, that was going on. And you'll see why here there's pneumobilia, centrally located, branching, pretty typical appearance. There is the decompressed gallbladder with a little bit of gas within it. And you can see it's right up against the duodenum. I look and look and look. I always want a big distended gallbladder full of gas so you can really make it clear to everyone that's the gallbladder and it's got gas it shouldn't have in it. Uh, and I gave up looking for that uh, when I realized that was foolish, right? When this happens, you've created a fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenal lumen through which the gallstone has passed. So of necessity, by virtue of that process, 
the gallbladder will be decompressed. You're never going to see one that's a big distended thing. So uh, you have to look very closely when you see gas in this region. It would be easy to confuse that with just a, a redundancy of the duodenum. Look at this hypodense wall thickening. This is a dramatically uh, obstructed duodenum that's really irritated by this uh, stone that's wedged right in there. This is actually the second most common location for a gallstone ileus, the first being the ileocecal region. But it makes perfect sense that right before the ligament of trites, where the duodenum takes a little upward swing and has a significant kink to its course, that's where these hang up. And now it all makes sense, right? The degree of inflammation in the duodenum, the amount of retching that this patient did to result in an esophageal rupture and a pneumothorax. So here's the new mobilia. We can follow that down to the decompressed gallbladder. You can see there it is meeting up with the duodenal lumen. Very nice shot of it right there. There's the decompressed gallbladder with gas in it, and there is the lodged gallstone. So again, second most common location for gallstone ileus. Let's look at that one one more time. Pretty dramatic case. This was actually in a 90-year-old male, and he did survive. Here we have it on the coronals. Beautiful view of the fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenum. And then there's more of that pneumobilia. Let's look at that again, because that really shows that fistula very nicely. There's the communication. Gallbladder to the patient's right, duodenal lumen to the left. All right, so that is a case of gallstone ileus.